Well, welcome back to the Silver Economy Summit. It's so good that you're all here again. My name is Helena St. James. I'm your host. And you know what? My brain hurts, but in a good way. I learned so much from yesterday's summit, and today will be no different. Now, you probably all know this already, but learning new things is good for you, especially if you're an older adult. Aging is more a frame of mind than a number. A friend of mine likes to say, and I love this quote, you're not as old as you're going to be. <laughs> His name is Tullio Tremonti. He's 96 years old, still lives alone in his home and still makes beautiful pieces of furniture by hand. He's a master craft craftsman and he's still learning about his trade. At the same time, he's contributing his amazing skills, his time, his experience to all who need him. Age has not stopped him. So we can take a page out of Tulio's life and start learning and contributing as we age. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what this summit is all about. Learning how to make our time as older adults the best time of our lives. So let's get the Silver Economy Summit Day 2 underway with our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is definitely a doer and a follower of her conscience. For 16 years, Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed was a public health physician and deputy to Nova Scotia's chief medical officer, Dr. Strang. But she left that position recently. And one of the reasons was the death of George Floyd. He was the Black American who died at the hands of the Minnesota police. Dr. Watson Creed's new job is Assistant Dean of Serving and Engaging Society for Dalhousie's University's Faculty of Medicine. So in this position, she's going to look at the inequities in health for the Black, the Indigenous, the immigrant, and the rural communities of Nova Scotia, as well as the LGBTQ community and older adults. So please, ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here with you this morning at the Silver uh, Economy Summit. Um, I'm going to be with you for just under an hour, I think. Um, I do have another commitment at, at 10 o'clock, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to pop off then. Um, and I didn't hear much of the conversation yesterday, but I have heard little bits about it. Um, so it has definitely created a buzz. And so congratulations on, uh, on that front. And I will start by acknowledging that I'm actually coming from you uh, today uh, from Dalhousie uh, University. Um, they graciously offered me a space uh, for the day because of the work that I that I need to do today. Um, and that, of course, is um, here in Mi'kma'ki and more specifically in Chibuktuk, um, so the Halifax uh, region. So happy to be here and happy to be uh, speaking to you from, from where I am. Um, I have to admit that I was a little... Um, perplexed maybe when I got the call to uh, to provide the keynote address this morning. And so I will try and frame for you what my early thinking is um, around this notion of this silver economy and what implications it has for health, wealth, and well-being. But I always start with some disclosures. And so today it's not going to be um, any different. Um, and so I do want you to be aware of a few things. I am not an economist. And I'm just going to say it again for emphasis. I am not an economist. I am a public health physician. Um, and so I start with those disclosures as opposed to the usual ones I do for academic talks about how my images have been obtained and the fact that I have no third party conflicts to disclose. But, but I start with that because I find uh, myself uh, more and more and still surprisingly, um, at least to me, over the past few years, drawn into conversations about economy and what the new economy could be for Nova Scotians and for Canadians. And so, uh, the first time I was called to such a conversation was with the One Nova Scotia Coalition, which, of course, many of you uh, would have been involved in and certainly um, would have known about. 
Um, and and uh, certainly in my work as the uh, chair of the Board of Engage Nova Scotia, um, uh, you know, we are heavily in a conversation about how to support a well-being uh, economy. Um, and then most recently, I was appointed to the task force, the federal task force uh, for women in the economy. Um, and so every time I kind of go, are you sure a public health physician really? Because um, I'm not an economist, right? Um, but what I think I bring to the conversation is a sense that, oh, just a sec, let me, there we go. Um, it, it is a sense that the, all of that work, so um, Engage Nova Scotia, I've referenced, and I know you'll hear from them uh, later, later today, all of that work is uh, based on some key principles. And so apologies for the faintness of this slide, but I, I will read out to you what it says on the arrows. And, and the point is that what I've come to realize in, in the many conversations I've been in, not just the ones I've, I've referenced, but in my previous work as a medical officer of health for the city of Halifax, working with uh, Halifax Regional Municipality, we were frequently in economic conversations. Uh, and um, health and economic participation are not divergent states. They're actually convergent. And so what we know from a health perspective is that income in particular is a key determinant of health. And participation in uh, the economy, having the opportunity to get that income, particularly if it's uh, uh, from a meaningful sort of set of activities, actually improves well-being. We have good data on that as well. So I think what we've what we used to think from a health perspective um, about uh, older adults in particular and their capacity to participate in the economy and to generate uh, income, be self-sustaining um, as a population, needs to be challenged, um, particularly because. Uh, you know, of uh, the, the, the positive impact um, that that economic participation can have for those populations, but also because actually our understanding of older adults and aging, I think, is changing. And this isn't something that in public health in Nova Scotia in recent years, we have paid a lot of attention to. My hope is that in the future, uh, public health will be uh, looking at this quite, quite critically. So I, I do think there are, there are some uh, health conversations that actually necessarily converge with the economy. The other thing that I would say with that <clears throat> about that is that uh, certainly as a public health physician, what I tend to bring to any of those conversations is a series of questions. And this is our public health method, but they're also um, systems thinking uh, methods. And I think they're important questions in, in any complex conversation. And I think economic participation is one of those uh, complex conversations. And so the questions are, who does get to participate and who does not get to participate? And for those who do not get to participate, why are they unable to participate? What are the barriers to that? And, and my, my colleagues in other branches of health will often look at barriers related to access to health care and management of health conditions. And while that's a piece of the puzzle, I think we understand more broadly that barriers to economic participation are, are much, much far reaching, uh, much more far reaching. The other uh, question that I think we bring to the table um, when we're there is a question of who gets to decide. And this is a systems thinking question. Who gets to decide who participates in the economy and who does not? How are the, the how is power sort of held in a conversation about economic participation? Are the people impacted by the decisions around economic participation part of the system of power that set up sets up the policies that dictate economic participation or non-participation. And those are trickier questions to answer uh, in some ways, but they're, in, they're intrinsic to the first question around what are the barriers to participation. So that's what we bring from a public health perspective. And so when I look just at a little bit of data um, around sort of uh, older adults and, and health outcomes, you can see that um, our, our thinking around this, at least from a health perspective, I think does have to uh, be challenged. And I have a few colleagues in geriatrics that I've had this conversation with over the years, particularly around food security for older adults. Um, and what they remind me of is that in our hospital institutions, like here at Dalhousie, where I'm sitting now on the campus of, um, of the QB2 uh, complex in downtown Halifax, um, we we forget that the folks who come in the doors of our facilities, who are often at their worst, are not necessarily representative of the entire population um, that they may be a part of, right? And so it, from inside our hospital institutions, I think it's, it's easy for us to assume that frailty is actually the natural state of aging, because often frail seniors is who we see, frail, frail older adults is who we see. 
Um, and the definition of frailty actually is a specific one, and there are indices that you can use to measure frailty, but it's that state of, be, of starting to degenerate from a, a muscular um, and nutritional status, but also from a, um, from a cognitive status at, at times. Um, the challenge that in population health and public health we often offer is that what we see in those institutions who are seeing the sickest of the sick is not necessarily the population, um, representative of the population as a whole. And so these are the Statistics Canada um, data on frailty in Canada and how prevalent it is. And what you see circled at the bottom of the slide are, are the, um, the numbers currently available on the StatsCan website. So between the ages of 65 and 74, um, uh, it's only 15% of older adults who would qualify as frail. That means that 85% of older adults in that category are doing just fine, thank you very much. They may have a health condition or two or three or four, but if they're living well with that health condition, it ceases to be a major issue. And that's often uh, counterintuitive for physicians who, you know, if you go to a diabetic clinic, then the, the presumption almost becomes that um, your diabetes is the most important thing in your life. And in fact, we have many people with diabetes who have all kinds of things filling their life that, are, and that don't revolve around their diabetes necessarily because it's so well managed. And so um, I think in some ways, our, our conceptualization of, of frailty uh, needs to similarly reorient. So it's only 15% of 65 to 74. It's only 27% um, of older adults, 75 to 84, um, who, who qualify as, uh, as frail. And certainly that number goes up after the age of 84, um, but it's not the majority of adults even then, um, it's about half. And so if you look at that from a Nova Scotia perspective, you see that we're on track um, with those numbers, you know, sort of uh, overall. And so these are the overall uh, frailty statistics um, for all the provinces and territories, including Nova Scotia. What you will notice in, in this list is that if you follow that column down for each province uh, and territory, what you see is that the numbers in terms of the number of uh, older adults over the age of 65 who, who are frail in Nova Scotia, are quite high by comparison to many other provinces. So we're certainly not higher than New Brunswick and the territories, but we are higher than all the other provinces. And that's, uh, that's concerning. The good news is that frailty um, in, in many ways can be prevented. And we'll talk about that um, in, in a little while. But I just, I put that out there and maybe this is an audience that doesn't need to hear this message because you already know. Um, but I think for my health system colleagues, um, we often do forget um, that frailty is not necessarily the given end state after age 65, um, quite the opposite. And I, I point to my, my own parents and specifically my father, who's 84 and living um, alone. My mother's in long-term care, but my dad is hale and healthy at 84. Um, every time I call him, he does complain to me that he feels like he's half dead, um, but that's after he's been out in the garden for six hours, weeding, digging, chopping, um, doing all the things that he does out there. Uh, and so, you know, I think that that idea that um, uh, older adults are, are, are doing well is an important one to hang on to. Part of the reason I start there is because two years ago, I was uh, invited to a uh, summit actually at Dalhousie University at the Faculty of Medicine. Um, it was one of our annual uh, training events for uh, faculty medicine leaders. And the, the panel discussion that evening was about the silver tsunami. That's what we called it. And what we were worrying about and pontificating about was whether or not the healthcare system could handle what we saw was going to be the drain um, from the glut of older adults that would be frail and coming through the doors in recent years. And make no mistake, currently there are projections in Canada that suggest that the uh, prevalence of frailty will increase in the next 10 years if we don't pay more attention to prevention. Um, and as a public health physician, I'm all about prevention. So I hear, I hear that message loud and clear. But it's interesting to me that um, here I am two years later talking to you about the silver, uh, sorry, the, uh, the silver economy and recognizing that our older adults are not necessarily a drain, as I've already pointed out. They're actually a resource. And in our conversations about the One Nova Scotia um, coalition and, and the sort of aftermath of the Ivany report, we had a lot of conversations about this. I participated in um, some conversations around uh, the Nova Scotia senior strategy at that same time, looking at what is the, 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 the resource that we need to um, 
to, to believe in and foster in our older adults because they bring so much to the table. This is their uh, wisdom, this is their knowledge, this is their economic prowess. Um, this is also their consumer power. And I know that internationally, that has been a major focus of the uh, silver economy uh, work. But I would hope that that's not the only focus of the work, uh, because I do think that we need to see older adults as much more than the next consumer target, um, and actually potentially um, a huge benefit uh, to our economies on a number of different fronts. And why not? And um, when you look certainly at Nova Scotia data, you will see um, that our older adults in many ways have got it going on. Uh, and so the data I'm gonna share with you now, you'll hear more about, um, I think later in the morning from uh, Danny Graham and others that engaged Nova Scotia. Um, but just to show you what we've, what we've seen from our quality of life analysis, um, which is a project that Engage has been uh, pursuing now for, for several years. Um, when we look at how uh, older adults rate their sense of belonging in their community in Nova Scotia, it's clear that uh, the older you get, the higher that sense of belonging um, is. And that sense of belonging actually can have a really um, Im important impact in that um, it, it, it's an anchoring force. Uh, that allows folks to sort of use that sense of belonging and community as a strong base to operate from. And so that includes operating in the economy. And I think that that's important um, to, to look out for. Um, so not surprisingly, our older adults also, um, you know, have a high sense of community uh, and that increases with age as well in, um, in Nova Scotia. And they experience relatively low financial insecurity. That's not to say that there aren't needs for older adults. And certainly, as I, as, as I pointed out already, I've been in conversations in the past around uh, food insecurity in older adults um, and recognize that uh, income in, insecurity and income instability in that group is, is a real risk um, as, uh, as paid work decreases. Um, but on the whole, there is some economic stability um, that we see in our older adults. That's, that's, I think, an important signal to pay attention to. They are also major providers of care, uh, both to children and uh, to other older adults, not surprisingly. I'm not sure we've looked at that in and of itself as the potential resource that it, that it is, and also um, the need to support that work in a way that enables and unlocks other participants in the, uh, in the economy um, in, in the way that we need to. So there's an important sort of ancillary function with the economy that's provided by older adults that I don't think we pay enough attention to and certainly don't give enough credit to. Um, sense of belonging, I think I've already done, uh, sorry. Um, and so here, so I think the slide actually that I had meant to put um, in here was that uh, in addition to um, providing care and um, and uh, having some financial security, but still some insecurities present in that group. There is also an increased sense of isolation in older adults that um, that we need to pay attention to. And so, there are some ways in which this is a population that has it going on. The question I would ask you, though, is: Are they truly welcome? to participate fully in the economy. And I use the framing of welcome regularly in now in my work and particularly when I'm talking about um, economic participation because I think it's helpful framing. It's actually something that came up for me for the first time when we were looking at the One Nova Scotia coalition work. And at the time we were looking at um, welcome of immigrant populations, but we very quickly extended the conversation to welcome of infant populations um, and children. And it's uh, through that conversation actually that the first chapter of the uh, One Nova Scotia Coalition report became about the early years. I, I like the framing of welcome um, because there are a few things about it that um, we can't ignore. And, and so when you start talking about it and we, when we started talking about it at the One Nova Scotia uh, Coalition table, what we recognized was that uh, what we were trying to impart to every person who lives in this province was a sense of citizenship. And that having the keys to citizenship, um, being able to participate fully as a citizen, no matter what age or stage of life you're at, was a critical uh, part of our success. And so while we started the conversation at the time about children in the early years, I wonder if we shouldn't be having a bit of a refresher conversation about whether or not our seniors have full access to citizenship 
are they fully welcome as citizens in the way that we would want them to be if we expect um, their economic participation and participation um, in a higher quality of life for all Nova Scotians in general. The thing about welcome is that it, it's an easily understood term. Every single one of us in this uh, conversation this morning knows what it means to extend welcome to somebody, and we know what it isn't. We know that welcoming somebody doesn't mean that they have to integrate to our ways or assimilate or that we're necessarily creating social cohesion just by that one act. Uh, act. And we also know that um, we know what it, it feels like to be unwelcome. Right? And we have a sense of, of what that means. And so I like welcome because it's the type of thing that you don't necessarily have to put a lot of academic language around. Um, folks can get the concept almost as soon as you say it. There is academic language that you can put around it. And so here are two uh, authors, one Canadian author and one American author, who have studied welcome largely in immigrant populations um, and uh, library settings, actually, um, in, in both of those uh, countries. Um, but they've actually been able to define what the elements of a quality welcome are. And I think it's worth paying attention to as we have any conversations about the economy and, and engage with the question around who is welcome in the economy and who is, who is not. So gainful participation and inclusion, opportunities for education and enrichment, certainly having stable housing, access to transit, of course, access to health care. Um, the ability to op uh, an opportunity to socialize, to participate in the long, being positively received in that environment and having political participation. Those are all the elements of a quality welcome. And so when I think about um, unleashing the capacity of older adults in the economy and in our communities uh, more broadly, I wonder to what degree all of these elements are being paid attention to and whether or not that could be a focus going forward. Um, as I said, we all know how to extend a welcome um, in, in our own way. And so here in uh, Maritime Canada, these are some traditional kind of scenes of welcome that we're, that we're used to and we pay attention to. Um, but here's the things that I would have you take away um, from the notion of, of being welcoming. Certainly, um, we do know when we're welcome and when we're not welcome. Um, but we need to be aware that welcome, in order to feel welcome, Somebody else has done something. Somebody else has made a gesture of some sort that has you feel welcome. So it is dependent not on your own behavior, but on the behavior of the others who are extending welcome to you. And so if any of us is in a position to extend welcome, it's always worth thinking about that notion um, that actually it is our actions in extending welcome that, that dictate the quality of the welcome. Um, it is active. Welcome does not happen passively um, by any means. You all welcomed, welcomed me uh, into the room this morning. Uh, that was an um, active work uh, by Helena. Thank you very much. Um, it is uh, therefore, you know, and obviously beyond the control of the person who's being welcomed, but it also, as I said before, isn't rocket science. Um, most of us inherently seem to know how to extend welcome to another person. And so as we think about our economic environments, I would wonder whether or not we are truly and fulsomely extending a welcome to older adults in that environment. And, in, and recently at the Task Force for Women in the Economy, I've asked the same question about whether or not we are extending welcome to women. Um, and I think in particular women as they age uh, in the economy are maybe not welcome um, in certain economic environments. And I think that's important to pay attention to and, and to rectify. So what would an economy that's welcoming of older adults look like? Well, I think first and foremost, it would involve older adults in the decision-making around what economic participation uh, looks like and needs to look like. And so that whole notion of who gets to decide, I think would be at the forefront. Um, so having older adults in those policy um, circles, I think is, is critically important. And again, I think uh, challenges previous, you know, kind of, uh, and I think widely held kind of ageist ideas around who should be making the economic decisions um, for Nova Scotia or, or for Canada. Um, I, I think a, a welcoming economy would certainly be oriented towards supporting older adults through a workday or work week in, in a way that makes sense uh, uh, for them and for what uh, whatever their life has, has brought or has become, particularly as we have older adults who are supporting so many other people in community, be it uh, grandkids or um, adult children in need or uh, partners in need. Um, 
that economy would be oriented to certainly to towards creating more health in older adults to support their ongoing participation. And this is often uh, where the conversation starts when I get asked to a conversation about older adults is something like, tell us how to keep older adults healthy. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure that's um, that's the only conversation from a health perspective uh, we should be have, having, and certainly not from a public health perspective. Um, but I think where that conversation does need to focus is actually on the built environment. And so here, I regularly challenge uh, communities and, and urban planners um, around what exactly are we talking about when we talk about inclusive communities? Are we talking about multi-generational communities? Are we talking about food secure communities? These are all things that impact the health and well-being of populations, but especially older, uh, older adults. And so I think actually building health into communities as opposed to trying to teach health into people um, is, is the way to do that work. I would say that a health system that's oriented around well-being um, would uh, look more at the overall outcome um, of somebody's quality of life versus looking for absolute presence or absence of disease. So as I said, uh, you know, I think from a health perspective, what we need to challenge ourselves around is the notion that um, the older adult with diabetes is a diabetic older adult. Um, and, and rather look at whether or not that diabetes is actually um, well enough ma managed that this is somebody who is having a fulsome life in community and their diabetes is the side story, not the main story. And again, I think our orientation as healthcare providers often uh, distracts us from that, that uh, broader picture. We do have measures of health um, that are more and more frequently used. Again, I do see this over the past three or four years, uh, and I'm glad for it that give better indications of illness and prevalence estimates. So um, quality adjusted, disability adjusted measures, we've always been fans of these in public health uh, because they do tell the story of um, whether or not the quality of life uh, or at least the quality of uh, sort of physical health um, is particularly damaged by the presence of the disease. And often we find that if the disease is well managed, then it's not. Um, I hear more and more from geriatricians on this point, and I think it's a valid one. Um, I think we, again, you know, when I started, I said, I think we used to think that um, frailty was the natural end state of aging, but in fact, we think we know that that's not true now. So aging is not preventable, that's true, but frailty can be. And uh, Helena actually alluded to this in her opening comments to say that, uh, you know, avoidance of frailty um, can, uh, you know, can be promoted by focusing on brain exercise in particular. So cognitive engagement, this is everything from, you know, crossword puzzles and, and reading to stimulating conversation, if that's your thing, um, or, um, you know, following news reports and, and uh, staying politically engaged. All of those things uh, are, are good cognitive exercise. Certainly physical exercise and, and the definition of that that we often use in medicine is strength, endurance, balance, and flexibility. So all four components need to be present um, but certainly continuing to focus on that as we age is, um, is helpful in, in reducing the impact of frailty and, of course, early identification. Um, but I would, I would see that as the default, um, where I think the, the first two are actually more in the prevention space. Um, I think by way of remarks, that was really all I was going to share with you um, this morning. I have no idea if it's what you thought you would get from me, but I hope it's, it's helpful. Um, I would end by just saying that I do think that the move towards the silver economy has to be more than looking at older adults as a new economic target group, recognizing that they do actually maintain a fair degree of, um, of financial stability um, um, as, as those populations age. And I can see how it's tempting to see um, the move towards the silver economy as a consumer kind of boon. Um, but I do think there's so much more to be said about the value that we place in, uh, in our populations as, as they age and the return on investment from investing in those uh, populations um, as they age. I think that's it from me. Thanks everybody for your time. Thank you, Dr. Watson Creed. Okay, I'm going to get I've got, I'm going to get a t-shirt made. I've, I've got my notes here from listening to you. So I'm going to get a t-shirt made. Uh, where is it? Yes. Uh, our older adults in Nova Scotia 
have got it going on. So I'm going, my t-shirt is going to say, cause I'm 74. My t-shirt is going to say, I've got it going on. <laughs> that was a, a wonderful and extremely informative uh, talk. I want to, I, I want to ask you uh, just a couple of questions to let people get their questions uh, into the Q and A. One of the things that I was, I'm just looking at my notes, so pardon me. Uh, we're trying, the business about trying to impart a sense of citizen, citizenship to everyone, and especially to seniors. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more, uh, you know, what does that actually mean to the person when they, when they see and feel that? What does that actually mean to the economy? I'm, I'm just having some trouble reading my bad writing. So the set of citizenship, when a senior, an older adult feels that sense of citizenship, what does that mean to uh, the economy? And we are cognizant of the fact that, no, you are not an economist, but from your perspective, please. Yeah, well, I think broadly what we, you know, what we understand, and we do see this in some of the well-being uh, literature, and I think it spills out actually into some of the literature that we were treated to um, around the economy with the One Nova Scotia Coalition, is that. Uh, uh, so citizenship, having a sense of citizenship, I think is related to the concepts I shared with you from those quality of life slides, so having a sense of belonging, have a sense of, having a sense of community, feeling like you have agency to participate in what's happening in your local environment. That's everything up to uh, political agency. So voting when there's election, that type of thing, but also down to volunteering and kind of everything in between. Um, I, and I think it's, it's, I think what we need to look out for and what we need to foster um, is a sense that our communities are inclusive of and welcoming of those engagements by older adults, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to shuffling older adults out of that picture and handing the torch of, of sort of citizenship and civic responsibilities to other people. Um, I think we lose a lot by doing that. And, um, and I think it happens often without us thinking about it. So when we sat down at the One Nova Scotia Coalition and had a very dedicated and deliberate conversation about um, what citizenship means for uh, adults, or sorry, for citizens at the other end of the spectrum, so uh, infants and children, what we recognized was um, that we weren't paying attention to what that could mean for having activated, motivated interested in community five-year-olds, what would it be like to bring them into school for the mm. first time at pre-primary, right? I think the same is true for older adults. If we maintain that activation and motivation and engagement in communities as, as people age in community, um, what benefits in turn do they reinvest back in the community because they're so motivated uh, to stay connected to it? So I think that's really the key around citizenship mm -hmm. is that folks feel like they're a part of something that's bigger than, than themselves. And I think we need to be deliberate about fostering that whenever and wherever we can. Does that, does that make sense to me? That, that makes sense. And I also uh, think to that point, uh, for seniors or uh, older adults, it's, it's feeling needed. I asked a friend of mine who, is, uh, who retired as a school principal and she was going way up north to Repulse Bay to work as a principal in the school there. And I said, yeah, it's the frozen North. Why are you going there? She said, because I feel needed. You know, so are, have you been it's muted? Yeah, it is a beautiful thing. Um, we've got some questions. I'm gonna to go to the first one. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, pardon my head going out of the screen because I've got, I've got three computers and a monitor here and, and my old eyes that need to squint a bit. So this is from Ed Leach. Uh, good words and philosophies, but there is much work to be done to bring this to reality. How might Nova Scotia move from where we are now in the welcoming economy, participation by, uh, are now in welcoming, sorry, economic participation by older adults? Might the work done on innovation and entrepreneurship be able to serve as a model? Yeah, I'm not intimately familiar with that work, so so I don't know. Um, but what I would say more generally is, I, I think there is an opportunity for uh, for older adults, and and I think um, everybody in in community to be asking a question of, around who's participating in decisions related to economic 
uh, viability for Nova Scotia? And where are the tables that bring that voice of older adults? Um, I think that opportunity comes up, um, quite frankly, every certainly every time a budget is delivered from provincial government. Mm -hmm. um, I think if it hasn't been inclusive of those voices and a critique around the fact that it hasn't been inclusive of those voices um, is appropriate. Um, I think it, it's an opportunity that comes up any time a sort of uh, economic roundtable or advisory table is struck. Um, I think there's a, an opportunity to ask the question around who gets to decide who's going to be part of that uh, conversation going forward. I actually think that that's a that's a fairly big deal um, to mm -hmm. get the engagement at those tables. Um, it's a funny thing. I you know as a public health physician, I used to think that uh, policy tables were these very erudite, well appointed, paneled boardrooms where the most wise of society were brought you know sort of one by one into the room and sat very uh, judiciously around the table. And the, the beautiful sort of uh, sophisticated conversations were happening. So and then I've been at a lot of policy tables in my career. And, you know, it's not that much different than the conversation that happens at your kitchen table. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe with a few good sort of uh, expert insights and availability of expert advice. And so um, I don't know why those tables can't be open more broadly. Um, to, to the folks who are impacted by the policy. So for my money, that, uh, that I think is a, needs to be a major focus if we're going to see the silver economy take off. Yeah, and uh, one of our speakers uh, yesterday said, uh, uh, nothing uh, about us without us. You know, so it, it speaks to, the, to that. Uh, another question from uh, Joanne Wise. What partnerships should we be working on to promote a more meaningful welcome for older adults of all backgrounds and experiences from your perspective? Uh, yeah, so I think that the agencies that hold a big part of the welcome for all members of our communities are the municipalities. So if I had to look anywhere um, to unlock kind of the keys to a quality welcome, I would start there. Um, and so engagements, with, for example, with municipal councillors to say, how can we make our communities uh, more productive, more welcoming of, uh, of older adults, I, th I think is, is a good one. Um, similarly, I, would, I wouldn't stop at municipal councillors. I would actually look to see uh, if you can find the city staffers who might be able to have the conversation about that. So most municipalities will have some kind of uh, finance or economic advisory committee. Um, they often publish reports that are public uh, and have the, um, you know, the names of the staff who are, um, you know, moving those reports forward or, uh, you know, sort of stewarding the, the committee along um, attached to it. And so, uh, you know, I think if, if there's, if, if folks have capacity, I would certainly start looking for those opportunities in municipalities. The other thing uh, that I would say is that there are a host of NGOs who are in conversations about welcome for a variety of different populations and, and know that territory well um, as well, including, you know, I mean, certainly engaged Nova Scotia is one, but, um, you know, the WISE across the uh, province, I think the, the WISE an organization has um, decades of history actually around welcome. Um, and so there are organizations like that, that I think um, support the conversation in, in a robust way. Uh, I have a question from John Hamlin. Great presentation, but how do we get across to the press, the public, government and business that seniors can do anything and can build the economy? Uh, well, it, it's, it seems to me without uh, being able to see who's in the audience, but I've seen a few of the names on the participants list and there are some folks I know there, it seems to me that you have some exemplars and, and champions in your midst today who yes. might be the right stories for the media to pick up on. Um, and I, you know, I th think if any of you have uh, those connections, for example, um, to media, I imagine that the summit organizers um, have some of that as well. Yeah, I, I think I would take advantage of the summit as a, as a you know, sort of an, another launch point um, to put those stories of older adults in community doing the right work because it needs to be done, um, to put those stories out there. And I think the public right now, with everything we've been through in the 
past 18 months is looking for good news stories. And it seems to me that the Silver Economy and the Silver Economy Summit are good news stories. So uh, maybe there's an opportunity right here. You're right. We're all looking for good news stories. Uh, Marjorie Williamson says, uh, we have a statement here, always a joy to hear your views and to know that public health issues takes a broad view. That's, thank you very much for that comment, Marjorie. Uh, Bill McDonald says, I appreciate very much your comment that older adults should be seen more than as an economic target as we see evidence that people's worth is more most often measured by their utility and ability to contribute to the economy. Are you considered that using terms like silver economy might reinforce that judgment. Hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm concerned. I don't know how the summit organizers feel about it, but I am concerned. I It was actually new terminology to me um, when I engaged with uh, the summit organizers about a month ago. And, and so I have been doing a little background uh, reading and research on it. And I am a little alarmed to see that internationally, the conversation seems to have been around uh, older adults as the next big consumer group um, because what's being recognized is that they are hanging on older adults are hanging on to their wealth um, much uh, better I think than was previ previously recognized and so I have a, a sense of sort of a, you know a, a background of, of investors and business people going who so what's the opportunity to get some of that money um, and gosh I, I hope that conversation doesn't only rest there um, internationally. And just from the flavor of the summit here in Nova Scotia, I have a sense that it it doesn't. Um, but I, I was a little alarmed to see the international framing of, of the conversation because um, it, it has the potential to be a fairly narrow focus. So my ask of all of you would be as much as possible, broadcast the bigger focus and keep going with that. That's an excellent point because, uh, you know, we are the boomers. We have economically influenced uh, so much, so many economies as we have passed through different ages. And, uh, and it will be a given that we are going to do something with this economy. The province and the feds put a full court press on innovation and entrepreneurship. Volta, Innovation District, Creative Destruction, uh, Creative Destruction Lab, Lab 2 Market. In the three to five year span, the landscape changed. Without a major effort to change, to change, things will not change. Without a major effort to change. And I think that kind of speaks to what you were just saying in your last point. Uh, the, the, I think the focus of our effort should be not just on the economy. And I'm really glad you said at the very beginning, I am not an economist because this is so, economy I think is, is a small part of it, an important part, but it's, it's something much broader, much bigger. It's much broader. And, and on that tech front, again, I would say that, you know, those are the things maybe for older adults to watch out for. So to the extent that governments, uh, start to adopt a focus that seems to be fairly exclusively, for example, on building a tech-based economy. Um, there may be a challenge, there's both opportunity and I think challenge to be brought forward in that. Too. And again, it's um, don't do that without, without bringing us along, right? Um, we have something to contribute and we do have spending power. Um, and where we want to spend our dollars actually is, um, is important too. And so tech may have some of those solutions but it can't have those solutions if it's not being created with older adults in mind and with older adults at the table. So, you know, I think to the extent that those, you know, fairly um, discrete uh, economic prosperity plans come forward, it's, it's worth challenging them on, on that front. Again, who gets to participate in shaping it? Yeah, exactly. Um, Helen McDonald, uh, no, excuse me, Mac uh, McDonnell says, uh, the World Health Organization age-friendly communities model captures everything you have mentioned as how to ensure older adults are welcome as participants and not as a cost. Uh, lots of work required and many partnerships, including municipalities, have to join the conversation. Please keep up, sh please keep sharing your message because you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I'm going to ask one final question because I was really intrigued by what you said about uh, feeling welcomed. And 
you, you said, you questioned that, you know, are we truly extending welcome to our old, older adults? Why do you say that? Um, I think I have developed a habit since we had that first conversation uh, um, at, uh, at the window of Nova Scotia table. Now, uh, anytime I walk into an environment looking around to see who's there and who's not, and for the folks who are not there, I wonder if it's because they're not welcome. Um, and I think there were many environments where we don't see our older adults. Um, and, in, and you know, just to give you an example, some of the conversations I've had in, in my work with Halifax Regional Municipality, where we have worked on healthy built environments, has include, uh, that's included, uh, for example, developers um, and architects. And we're having a conversation about inclusive and age-friendly communities. And we're having a conversation about what to do with um, the Cogswell Exchange and, and you know, what that community could look like. And I've had conversations with developers where I've said, so is this gonna be a multi-generational community? And they go, nah, we're, you know, we're gonna target the people who have the money. It's gonna be the single young people with disposable in income. Um, so not families, not multi-generational families, not older adults. And I go, so we have a lot of evidence that supports that when you create a multi-generational community, the whole community benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so I, so I, I, I have a sense that we're not paying enough attention to that. And I guess that's why I, I asked the question, Helena, about are we, are we paying attention to the welcome that we're extending to older adults? Because um, I'm not sure that we always do. Yeah. Are we just on the threshold of really changing the way we view older adults, the way we view our, our economy as well? This, this, it sounds to me like I've been listening to the speakers. It sounds like, uh, and, and to you this morning, it sounds like there is an unbelievably difficult, perhaps, job for us to do to change uh, the way people think about us and how we can contribute. I, I, yeah, so I don't know how difficult it will be. I think the fact that there is this international conversation about the silver uh, economy and that that conversation seems to have shifted away from the silver tsunami um, as, as the tide that was coming, I, I think it's actually, as much as I have some concerns about, um, you know, that, that consumer focus taking over the agenda, I do also think that there could be a big opportunity in that um, as it becomes sort of an economic imperative to look at older adults for the resource that they are, I think the whole conversation has the potential to change. Um, so I, I don't know that actually that it's that far away. In fact, I think my, you know, in the health system, we may have some catching up to do from the conversation that we had two years ago um, when we were looking at the, you know, sort of the silver tsunami um, as the thing to pay attention to. I think maybe the conversation is already out of the starting gate. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness for that. So I'm going to remember and take to heart what you just said about aging is not preventable, but frailty can be. That's uh, as well as I've got it going on. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much, Dr. Watson Creed, for the incredible knowledge that you have given us today. You were a great start to uh, the second day of the Silver Economy Summit. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure and I hope you all have a fantastic day. Thanks.